Thank you, everybody, for um, for joining us today. This is the um, aesthetics of accessibility panel, which I feel like we've already we've already aestheticized some aspects of accessibility for you, which includes nervous people running around and hoping that they're gonna get it right, which is a beautiful sight to me, actually. And thank you so much for all the work that you've done around accessibility. So um, already so far in this panel. Um, so my name is Allison O'Daniel. Um, I am a visual artist and a filmmaker, and I've been working on a project called The Tuba Thieves for um, like 11 or 12 years or 10 years or something like that. <laughs> and um, I'm very close to finishing it. And um, it's a project that is really, I think, deep, deep in this conversation about the aesthetics of accessibility without me having ever named it as such, uh, which I think a lot of a lot of other disabled artists that I know are, you know, th this term is kind of existing maybe to understand us, and but we've existed for a while and we exist and we will continue to exist. And so um, I, uh, my project is um, made with many, many people across the spectrum of um, deaf, deafness and, um, and is an exploration of the perception of sound in Los Angeles in many ways. And um, the people on this panel, some are newer to me and um, some I know quite well and really love and deeply respect their work and are, and are influences of mine as well as I, th I feel a, um, a kinship and like a trading of influence um, and collaboration, which is really a beautiful experience for me. So I'm going to be using my phone, which I have um, their bios on, and then um, and then we will, I have some screenshots of everybody's work that as I'm reading their bios, I think maybe we could show on the screen if anyone back there is ready and has them. And you can just, um, I think there's about seven images. They're all, um, they're screenshots from Liza's work. So this is an image from Jordan's work. So I'll, I'll start with Jordan Lord. And, um, so, Jordan Lord is a filmmaker, writer, and artist. Their work addresses the relationships between historical and emotional debts, framing and support, access, and documentary. Their films have been shown at festivals and venues, including MoMA, Doc, Fortnite, DocuFest Kosovo, Union Docs, and the Berwick Film and Media Arts Festival. They presented solo exhibitions at Piper Keys and Artist Space. Their work has been feature featured in publications such as Art Forum, Screen Slate, Art in America, and hyperallergic and is a primary focus of a chapter in Pooja Rang Rangan's upcoming book, The Documentary Audit. They teach at Hunter College, um, the New School, and Vassar College, but maybe all, not all right now. Maybe they have taught at some of those places. Um, I think I have one more. Okay, so this is an image from um, Liza's work. So, can we just, I'm gonna navigate some. There we go. Okay. Liza Silvestre is a multimedia artist and research assistant professor within the College of Fine and Applied Arts at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where she has co-founded the initiative CRIP, with an asterisk, Cripistemology and the Arts. Her work has been shown internationally at venues including the Plains Art Museum in Fargo, Wiseman Art Museum in Minneapolis, Roots and Culture in Chicago, the Soap Factory in Minneapolis, Sioux Visual Arts Center in Minneapolis, John Hansgard, Hansard Gallery in Southampton, Argos in Brussels, I was in that show with her, and MMK in Frankfurt. Sylvester has been the recipient of both an artist initiative and arts learning grant from Minnesota State's State Arts Board, a fellowship through Artists on the Verge, a VSA Jerome Emerging Artist Grant, an Artworks Grant from the NEA, and a fellowship from the Kate Neal Kinley Foundation, and most importantly, she's been named a 2021 Joan Mitchell Fellow. Um, I think the next image is also from Liza's, oh no, that's Jordan's again. And then, so this is another image from Liza's work. And this one as well. Um, so this is an image, you can stay on this for a second. This is an image from Daniela's work. So 
documentalist, producer, and cinematographer. Uh, sorry, Danielle, Daniela Munoz Barroso is a documentalist, producer, and cinematographer. She's the co-founder of the independent Cuban production company, a Studio ST. Her short film, Gloom, from 2010, was screened at Documenta 15 in Castle and in Open Doors in Locarno in 2021. 2021. Tw yeah. Uh, producer of the short film, the Ro she's the producer of the short film The Rodeo, which had its world premiere at Rotterdam in 2021, and um, and Tundra with North American premiere at Sundance. Her documentary Mafifa had its world premiere at the Luminous section of, I of IDFA in 2021. And then um, we can go to the next image. So this is um, a still from a film that, I don't know if you captioned it, or, yeah. yeah, okay, that Sean captioned. And so sitting next to me is Sean Welsh. Sean is the co-founder and lead subtitler for Matchbox Cine and project, the project lead on Sidecard. Um, Matchbox Cine are an award-winning subtitler working with best with festivals including Open City, Alchemy, and Sundance London, distributors including Sovereign, Hopscotch, and 16 Films, filmmakers and venues to create access materials for over 1,500 films. Um, as subtitle manager for movie, he created the descriptive subtitles for movies, theatrical releases, among other responsibilities. Sidecard is a new online resource for logging and researching access materials made for films. Matchbox Cine are also uh, independent film exhibitors and producers of screening series and festivals, including Weird, Week Weird Weekend, Kajarama, and Keanu Khan. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Thank you all. Thank the panelists. Thank you to the panelists for being here. And uh, I think we'll just dive in. I'm aware that I'm going to, I'm going to, I have, I have a bunch of questions, and so, but I want to leave some time for Q and A. So, um, I thought that I would have each of you, um, even though I just read your bios, I thought I would have each of you introduce yourself in kind of a specific way. And I was thinking that um, it might be interesting for you to introduce yourself in relation to your experience or history with accessibility. Um, and this can also be intertwined, um, either how you are requiring access or how you are providing or modeling access. Whatever you want to do with that. I thought you could each introduce yourselves that way. So maybe Jordan, could we start with you? Hi, everybody. Oh my gosh, I am really excited to be here with all of you. Um, I actually, I should have asked you if we were going to do this, Allison, uh, but I usually like to start with a visual description, and I guess I also um, offer that up to anybody else who wants to do it, but I'm just excited about my outfit today, so I was like, I'm not going to go without doing a visual description, um, and that can also be a way of uh, introducing myself. So I'm wearing like a pleated top that kind of is iridescent, and I'm wearing my grandmother's costume jewel, uh, costume jewelry pearls, and uh, I'm like, uh, in my office in front of um, an artwork by my friend Park MacArthur uh, in the background, she can't really see very well. But, um, oh, and I'm a white person with uh, a beard and um, like a faded haircut. I got my haircut today for this. So um, anyway, uh, how I came to accessibility is um, really through being part of disability community. Um, I think I really was part of disability community before I had personal experience of disability or even disability. Um, then in 2018, I um, had open heart surgery and my community really is like what carried me through that. And so it was the first time in my life that I was dependent on other people. And at the same time, I was also trying to process that experience or maybe distance myself from that experience by making a film about it. Um, and uh, I had already been thinking around questions of access in my work because um, Karen Lazard is a friend of mine who's also a really amazing uh, disabled artist who um, made this film Recipe for Disaster uh, in 2018 um, that is like a real kind of media accessibility manifesto and in a lot of ways is very interestingly about 
like access not only as transparency but also as interference and opacity. Um, anyway, I'm getting a little bit sidetracked, but this is all to say that we were like, oh, it's you know very strange that we're trying to make work about disability that doesn't uh, have access as a central component. And so while they were working on that, um, I was working on this film that I made while I was in the hospital after after access. And um, for me, access started to open up in all of these different ways, both because I was in school uh, for documentary at that time. And I was hearing access being talked about in this really weird way to me, um, which was about like access to people and locations. Like that's a frequent convention that um, the contracts that are used to like gain permission to film somewhere or to film someone are called access agreements. And so I was like, wait, how does that have to do with this form of access that's important to me, which is about like, of course, access in terms of disability. And um, so that film was the space in which I was both trying to imagine um, like what would it look like for um, you know, my extended community to be able to watch this film, so trying to make it accessible through audio description uh, and captioning, um, but also extending this kind of like larger question about like, uh, as we um, try to like facilitate access for each other or within disability community, how is this form of access also happening alongside like access to us or access to um, you know, two people um, on camera in medicalized settings, how are these things related? And um, we can talk more about that later, but I think that kind of is how I came to it. Um, I get one more thing I'll say is that uh, I think a question that's become really important to me over time has really been then what does it mean to work uh, around questions of disability when the people that you're working with are not, don't necessarily identify as disabled. Um, and so, for instance, like with my family, I'm probably like the least disabled person in my family, but I'm the only one who IDs that way or who identifies that way. Um, and so in working with my family in two other films, um, audio description in particular has become this space where um, we can sort of acknowledge the existence of like need in a space where that need is really being like actively disavowed um but it's it, it rubs in interesting and i think important ways around these questions of like who is in a community who disidentifies with that community based off of their lived experience who has like the most needs at any given time who's denying that they have need um so these are all things i'm really interested to talk more about if that's stuff that y'all are interested to talk more yeah, thank you, Jordan. I um, I love also that you were excited in your visual description to talk about your outfit and kind of forgot to talk about your face. <laughs> um, and I did intend to do that, and I just got a little like caught up in my own accessibility here. Um, and but so I, for I am now. This is Allison speaking now, and um, I am a white woman with brown wavy hair. I have a new haircut that I'm calling a hearing aid haircut because I got it cut to show off um, the ways that I'm holding up my hearing aids, which is like through a lot of uh, bold jewelry. Um, and I'm wearing brown square glasses and a uh, gray shirt. And that's good. And I will now pass it on to Daniela. <laughs> well, hello. Do you remember the question? <laughs> it was just to remind eh, you of the question. Yeah. Bueno, me encantó lo de hacer una descripción eh, virtual. I loved. I I, I loved the self-description, the virtual self-description. Thank you. It was wonder, wonderful. I'm a woman. I'm white. I'm using, I'm wearing some um, big headphones and I've got a rag on my head and it's all knotted together. Uh, 
I'm on the other side of the Atlantic, and so it is dark here. It is nighttime. I'm Cuban. I was in Cuba up until a year ago. It's different in Cuba when it comes to accessibility. It's a... Do, am I going too fast? <laughs> My experience might be a little different than others. I started losing my hearing when I was young. It's been a slow process, and I actually don't know where it will end up or how it will end up. And at some moment along the way, I discovered film, and I realized that it was something that really called to me. And I I thought that maybe the fact that I didn't hear very well would be something that uh, would make it so that I wouldn't be able to participate in the industry. And now I understand that I have a completely different understanding. I started to study film. And then what I realized is that losing my hearing and what I was interested in came together. They mixed together and film becomes an escape route for me. It's a way to explore others and to explore myself. Oh, excuse me. Um, y bueno, realmente uh, estoy justo en el proceso de cómo reinterpretar estas películas and que yo que so yo veo. Really in the middle of a of the process of reinterpreting the films I've been working with. I want to, I want them to be more accessible for people who are in the same situation as I am. Mm -hmm. I think that's the important things, the important thing. And this being here in this conversation is going to be so illuminating. Thank you. Thank you. And Liza, do you need me to repeat the question? Yeah, hi. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Um, this is Liza, Celeste speaking. Um, I'll start out with a visual description as well. I'm um, a white woman with chin length hair that is questionably blonde, maybe brown now, as I've gotten older. Um, I have glasses on with clear frames and a white uh, neck shirt. Behind my right shoulder is a kind of big green plant. Um, I'm also very grateful to be here, so nice to be connected to all of you. And thank you, Allison, for bringing us together. Um, I wish I was there in person. Um, my relationship um, with accessibility is complex. Uh, like Daniela, I grew up losing my hearing, started at about six years old. Um, and my, my childhood was really colored by uh, the impending fear and anxiety that my family had around the fact that I would eventually be deaf at this uh, unknown date in the future. We didn't know if it would happen tomorrow or if it would happen 30 years from now. And it ended up taking a, a long time. I received a cochlear implant uh, in my late teens. Um, and I'm now completely medically, absolutely 100% deaf, unless I have my cochlear implant on. So I would say my relationship to disability is also very complicated by um, technology. And I have a convoluted relationship to technology and um, the access that it both grants me and, and prevents me from having fully. Um, so I, I would say that I, I should also mention that I, I grew up, 
I'm almost 40. I was born before the ADA was passed um, in 1990. And so I feel like the combination of my sensory situation being very um, in flux was confounded by the fact that access and how we approached access legally in this country was also in flux during my formative years. And so things like knowing how to advocate for myself, um, knowing that advocating for myself was okay, those were things I learned much, 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 much later as an adult. And those are things that I still struggle to do well as an adult <laughs> who works in disability and makes art about disability. Um, I would say that the way that disability and my uh, relationship to disability through my work, um, disability is always sort of the, the starting point for me. And I'm always more interested in the generative aspects of disability. What do I gain through my relationship to sound and communication? Um, because it's absolutely something that is not a lack. It is an actual experience. And so I will, I maybe we'll stop there so we have time to get to other people, but that's where I think I'm especially interested in making sure that that comes through in this panel, that disability is um, an enormous source of creativity for me and potential. Awesome. Um, I feel this is going to be one of those panels where I have like a neck ache afterwards from nodding <laughs> in agreement um, and understanding. And Sean. Hi. Um, so I am, um, visually speaking, uh, a white man with uh, grey beards, glasses, and unfortunately an extremely basic outfit of black t-shirt <laughs> and uh, black baseball cap. So. My relationship to accessibility, I, um, I have no disability personally. I am a little brother, I um, have cerebral palsy, so in some sense I've been around questions of access my entire life. But practically speaking, I became a subtitler professionally in 2008. I worked for a company called Red B, who were the subtitlers for television in the UK. They originally were the in-house subtitlers for the BBC, but they were spun off and became subtitlers for BBC Channel 4, a number of other channels, some commercial. So I did that for a long time in parallel with working in an exhibition, putting on film screenings and uh, curating film festivals. Um, it was only when I went freelance as a subtitler that I was able to fully embrace our own events being fully accessible. And so um, we had been having inaccessible screenings up until that point. And it was only when I realised that when I had access to the equipment uh, at home, because I couldn't use it at work, um, that I realised there was something I could do and therefore should do. And from that point, um, it was a learning curve for us in terms of how we can best present our, our events accessibly. And at the same time, then um, embarking as a career as a professional freelance sub type, whereas Matchbox Danny sub, uh, specialising in film exhibition. So we were able to um, start to subtitle films for festivals, for distributors, for uh, venues, for, for a whole brace of different contexts. Um, and also bringing that practice from the state broadcaster, or the BBC rather, to the film world. And those questions of access, applying them to film screenings and, and accessible screenings. And so, yeah, that's just been a case of developing that practice, um, primarily focused at making films accessible to deaf audiences. Um, and so that's been my learning curve of accessibility personally. Um, and that's what we do now. And we do a lot of advocating for accessibility as well. And that's what we like to sidecard. Um, I was in preparing for this. I just I was doing a little bit of thinking about um, a, about this question that I'm asking all of you about our varying access. Can you all hear me? Um, Alison, um, we can hear you, but we're having a hard time hearing Sean. Ah, okay. Can you test again? Uh, testing. Okay. Can you hear me now? Apologies if it's partly my accent that's the issue. <laughs> okay, I'll keep checking in. I mean, I can see all your faces, and I'm excellent at reading, not hearing on a in a facial expression. I would say so. I'll I'll pay attention. 
Um, but I was um, I was struck by you know in this panel I think Liza Daniela and myself are um, deaf without the and absolutely correct me if I'm wrong, um, Liza and Daniela on this, but I think one of the things that we, the three of us share is being um, deaf without the capital D, deaf of community um, support, specifically, we have community now, but of community support and inclusion in maybe at various times of our lives in more ways or not. Um, but none of us were, in other words, none of us were born into deaf families and had that kind of like education and immediate support from the get-go. So this is things, this, this is something that we've all come into later. Um, and so in different ways, we move from isolation, this experience of isolation into broader disability communities through our work. Um, and each of us uses captioning as a reflection of our lived experiences and a desire to communicate and to <coughs> examine communication. Um, and I also think we are each giving voice to a complex view of deafness away from the medical binary of um, fully hearing or fully deaf, but into like much more compl complex lived experiences. Um, and then Jordan, I think, from my understanding of your work and your experience, that um, your relationship to disability is very much around um, questions of, or the exp the time-based experience in a way of healing, and um, and then moving into the existing supporting kind of, or not supporting infrastructures around this act of healing. And, um, and what I noticed in your work was actually this very opposite experience, or like I would not, talk about your experience in terms of isolation at all. In fact, like your work is deeply rooted in social and, uh, or your experience is deeply rooted in social and familial support, um, which is really, for me, really powerful to watch. Um, and <coughs> in your work, um, you're utilizing the filmic media languages of access, specifically captioning and audio description. Um, within the work, the in infrastructure around the work, you talk about it a lot, but um, what we experience as we are watching it, um, you're using those as a material in order to discuss access as a whole concept. Um, though these particular tools are not necessarily needed by you personally, um, you're exposing the ways that access makes everything better for everyone. And then Sean, um, I really like this term that's newer to me as an access worker. I think Louise Hickman is using this term a lot. Um, so in the UK, I think this term is maybe a little bit more, I don't think it's used really at all in the US. Um, and so you're filling a void that catalogs accessible films and creates incentive and pressure just via the ease of the platform um, for the film industry to be inclusive. And accessibility, so accessibility from the ground up, basically, um, which starts from inclusion rather than scrambles to kind of figure it out after the fact, which seems to be such a consistent thing in filmmakers' processes. So that's rad. Um, okay, so I just wanted to kind of like make those connections and then move into our next, the next question that I had, which is who is your audience? Who is the accessibility in your work for? And how has this evolved for you personally? Um, whoever would like to start, actually. Maybe Liza? <laughs> Um, yeah, this is this is Liza speaking. Can can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, my audience. This is a great question, um, and I I absolutely think it's something that has changed over the course of the past ten years or so. Um, I think that I started out making work um, for able-bodied people to teach them about my experience that felt so separate from theirs. Um, and I think I also absolutely made work for myself. Um, a lot of my 
Living Image Work uh, draws upon activities that I've participated in my entire life when I've been sort of pretending to be uh, a hearing person or t pretending to be able-bodied. Um, so a lot of my work has given time and space uh, for m my existence to have value. <laughs> um, just for myself, you know, I, I, I've made films where I'm looking at these films and they never stop being the historical artifacts that they are, but in the space of the captions that are missing, I'm inserting my disabled death commentary of the film. Um, and so that work has been, for me, in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, and I think it's also been uh, sort of the shift away from making work for an able body to making work for a disabled body. Um, and then a lot of the work that I do at the university where I, I teach is um, around teaching what a crip epistemology could be what the knowledge gained <coughs> in and around and by the disabled experience, um, how that knowledge has value for everyone um, and, and should be valued by everyone. So this broadens the, the borders around you know, <coughs> disabled artwork is for, and it says that it's for everyone, that actually this is a knowledge set that everyone could benefit from. Um, and that is actually everyone's responsibility to, to know about. Um, I, I should also say that this question made me think about the way that I make work um, in relationship to disability. A lot of work around disability and art at intersection um, can feel um, well, daunting, A, but there's often this uh, expectation for disabled people to sort of show their disability, to put it on display, um, to really lead with that aesthetically. And that um, is something that I resist because I, I feel that that is for an able-bodied audience. And so when I am grappling with disability in my work, I'm, I'm always trying to, and this is where the epistemology, the epistemology comes in, we start with disability, we understand it's a knowledge base, but then we move to, this is a generative knowledge base, this is a positive thing, um, this is not uh, existing for a normative audience to understand that there's a distinction between disability and ability. <laughs> Um, it actually implicates everyone. So long story short, I would say that through the course of learning how to do this work in public and in institutional spaces, it's become really important that my work and the audience is for everyone. Um, I can maybe build on, or I can, like, this is Jordan speaking. Um, I think I want to go next just because I think I really relate to the trajectory that you're talking about, Liza, of feeling like in many ways my work maybe was starting out to, like, teach non-disabled people something, um, and then, like, leading toward this kind of question of uh, what it means for it to actually really be for a disabled audience and or, like, primarily a disabled audience and then if a non-disabled audience gets something from it that's cool too um i think a lot of my work uh has to do with like a kind of like speculation about who an audience like a, about an audience that already exists um but isn't like thought of as like one audience is thought of as like many audiences um and is usually like held apart in many different spaces um you know a term that i've heard used to talk about this is like segregation, um, though I think it's maybe a fraught term in relation to this um, because I'm not sure that integration is necessarily the only thing that I'm looking for to come out of this, uh, like by, by foregrounding access um, in my work, but 
Um, I do think it's problematic that, um, you know, the way that, like, access has been conceived of, like, closed captions or audio description as sidecar files are, like, one example. It's, like, and sorry, I'm, like, doing this, like, work that I think in many ways has to do with, like, education of, like, non-disabled people, again, to get to the point that I actually want to make. Um, but it's, like, uh, you know, I do really believe in this kind of question of, desegregating audiences along lines of ability because like there are disabled people in every audience there are like blind and deaf audience members regardless of if they're like captions or um or audio description though uh you know which is something that i think you know your all of your work actually kind of shows in some fundamental way um but then it's like thinking about um, what kind of films I actually want to make. It's not only that I think in many ways my work is for filmmakers to like understand that if they're not thinking about access, that they're just kind of fundamentally like not directing their films for like deaf audiences that they don't have captions, they're not directing their film for blind audiences that they don't have audio description. It's also about like imagining like the space where like um, like disabled and non-disabled people are uh, in a shared space and I think specifically like whether it's like along with exactly like these axes of identity it also has a lot to do with like thinking about like the two very different like groups of people that I feel like most close to which are like um you know like leftist like people in New York in one space and then like my very conservative but still disabled like family in Mississippi, um, who often like enters my work, is a support system for me and in, 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 in uh, the work as well. And also trying to think about like a space where like both of those audiences could exist in the same place. Um, and I think that the interesting thing about um, like how audio description functions in my film shared resources, for instance, which is like this film that I made with my parents um, over a five year period. Um, you know, my dad has kind of always dealt with chronic illness, but um, was specifically like having, um, you know, more and more trouble seeing things. And um, that was actually a lot of where the original idea came from to like make a film that had audio description because it was also thinking about like what version of the film would he be able to experience at the end of a five year period. But then, but I think it's also really important to note that like, not only does he kind of disidentify with blindness and, you know, still um, has a lot of capacity to see, he also, like, has a very, you know, real commentary on, like, uh, what it is to see. That, like, you know, seeing is, like, fundamental to, like, being human is basically what he says, you know, which is, of course, a very ableist thing to say, but it's also something that he's saying from like his experience of, you know, uh, not having disability community of not having even like, not even wanting to identify with this term of disability, but then um, like audio description like becomes something else for him in the film other than just like, a, um, you can't see, so you need this thing. It's actually like this, this strange space of like communication for him and my mom, where it's like my mom is participating in the process uh, doing the audio description for the film and in a lot of ways I think the way I see her taking up that role as an access worker is actually also to sort of like maintain like my dad's view of things like to to try to like to show that she sees like dignity and like my dad's experience where he sees like um, something that was like very shameful and exposing um, she's like kind of trying to reassert that like she like sees him in this other way um, and I think that's a really interesting thing as well where it's like of course I think um, all of our work in different ways deals with the kind of like non-neutrality of, of access especially like when access takes the shape of translation um, I'm also interested in like this kind of relational part of uh, access that like is doing a lot of different things um in terms of like meeting need 
that go beyond like, I can't and so I do this for you. It's actually something also about like, um, like seeing needs, maybe even meeting needs that people uh, don't think of themselves as having or, um, you know, but, but that like that is in some fundamental way actually like this, I mean, I, I was thinking of the term surplus when you were talking earlier, Liza, about like how disability is like not a deficit, but rather like this really like, I, I mean, I think another way I've also heard it often talked about is like PIP wealth. Like I think about this kind of PIP wealth that um, happens through the space of access um, where it's like actually also a lot about like how, you know, like how in needing a thing like there's also like this real I don't know, I'm kind of losing my train of thought, but maybe if someone understands something about what I'm saying here. Um I I would say let's hold that because I I also want to hear Sean and Daniela talk about their yeah. audiences. Um and who who you make your work for or who your accessibility who you make your work for. Every, every filmmaker gets asked this question, who is your artist? I mean, who is your audience? And I'm curious to speak, the reason I'm asking this question is because I think the way we think about and have relationships to our audiences as disabled makers is um, very inclusive of ourselves um, and our experiences. And so I'm, that, that's part of the reason why I'm asking this question, because I think it's very layered for us. So Daniela, Rashawn, um, who is your audience and how has that changed and how does that change as you make your work? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, there's, there's still time for it to change. I haven't been in this for so, so many years. I think my first way of understanding film was as a tool to communicate with people who can hear. In fact, the sound design for the two movies I've worked on was laid out so that people who listen w would hear the way I hear. And so I think the reason I did it like that is because I wanted to be accepted. It was like a need to be accepted. And, and so I think that the, I laid out the films that way because uh, I wanted to create a contrast. I, you know, and, and I as a consumer have always had to just watch film in any way that I could. If there's not subtitles, there's no subtitles. If I can't hear, I can't hear. And and so that's why uh, I did the film like I did, you know, and that's why I was always so insistent that filmmakers really needed to make the, the images speak for themselves. And so what I have really discovered is that there's other ways to do this. There's other ways to tell the story. Oh, how do I explain it to you? I, I, I'm really thinking, how do I do this differently? So that, so that I, it can be understood, you know, whether it's in, in, in German, in different languages, in, with different audiences, so that they can really perceive what I, what, what, 
what I what I am experiencing create a very sensorial experience with the film. At the end of the day, I'm actually I have a lot of internal conflict about how to move forward. I share that. I get that. <laughs> so, um, interesting. I'd like to, to speak about it. our practice, my practice in Matchbox is really just myself and my colleague Calvin, who do practical subtitling. Um, our, the, our guiding light, our ethos, is always to create as equal an experience as possible uh, for the audience, um, for the, a bit louder. Um, yeah, so my, our ethos is always to uh, create an equal, ex as equal an experience as possible. So when we are creating subtitle files, descriptive subtitle files, as we tend to call them more than captions, actually, in the UK, um, we are trying to strike a balance between the um, the integrity of the film and the filmmakers, and the the red line requirements of accessibility, and at the same time, because these they're primarily for a theatrical context, not always. And as I say, we, we make subtitles for a whole range of contexts, but we have to imagine that there's not a monolithic audience, and we also have to consider the. There's that a kind of edict that the the best subtitle is an invisible one, which is quite contradictory, really, to what we're talking about. So, um, and so we, in a way, we don't want to break that immersive experience. We, we want to bring the audience with us. We got to imagine that the um, the the audience that's making use of these subtitles themselves are not monolithic. You know, some of you know, you know we're talking about uh, an audience. Um, you know, from a point of view of, of the, the deaf audience, there's obviously um, people that have been deaf from birth, and there's people that have been deafened, that are, have got partial hearing, um, and they all have various ways of interacting with the film. And they're also sitting beside fully hearing people. And we want to consider the fact that all these things that can break that experience, um, the way that, like, uh, for a kind of, an audience that doesn't make use of the subtitles, if the film was out of sync, the, the audio was out of sync with the video, if there was a glitch in the audio, if there was a glitch in the video, the screening would just stop. You know, people, you break the dream of the, of the film and everyone gets knocked out of it. It's the same thing for subtitles, um, as, as, as the way we approach them. And so um, we, we, we have to think, in terms of our audience, as primarily the, the deaf audience, that non-monolithic audience, but we're thinking about that in the context of the, the whole audience um, because the same things apply. You need, your subtitles need to be accurate, they need to be full, they need to not contradict, you know, they can't be out of sync and they can't be heavily edited, even really edited at all if possible. Um, so we're having to bear in mind and, and think about this, this shared audience, this shared experience. Um, so it's interesting um, when we talk about like not segregating the audience. That's that's something that's built into what, how we approach these things. And it's also infor informed our practice as exhibitors. When we first started uh, making uh, subtitled screenings or engaging with that, even though at that point I'd probably been making subtitles for almost a decade, um, I still had the, the, the thought in my mind that, you know, better to not have subtitles on screen if we don't need them. You know, and what about if somebody needs the subtitles, they can just ask for them, we'll put them on. Otherwise, we don't have to have them, better that we don't have them. And of course, um, you don't have to go very far in your journey with accessibility to realize that's not access. And so we very quickly realized that like, we needed to have subtitles on screen by default, no matter what. Um, and of course, we also engage with the fact that there's actually no such thing as 100% accessibility. Um, for some people, um, subtitles on screen uh, has that breaking the experience quality for them because, um, you know, even though there are a portion of the audience that are neurodivergent that, that, that really benefit from the subtitles, there's the same, not the same necessarily, don't have the statistics. There are portions of the audience that are people who, for whom the, the subtitles on screen makes it impossible for them to, to uh, enjoy the film. And so, um, we say that just to bear in mind that, like, because quite used, quite often it's used as an excuse. Well, we can't do this. We shouldn't. Do, you know, it's it's hard to do this, so we shouldn't do it. 
or it's impossible to get it completely right, so we shouldn't try. So we say that like um, it's impossible to have 100% access just to kind of build that in as part of the approach. And of course, one of the things we're aware of as exhibitors is that um, even as we do our best to make um, descriptive subtitles more normalized and uh, hard-coded open subtitle screenings, open caption screenings, the norm, and we advocate for this pretty heavily, um, we, we don't have the same level of investment in audio description for, for the blind audience. We do that um, as we do that as a we've started to do that as a part of our uh, offer as part of our company, and we've been able to do that for some online programs that we've had. Um, but um, the expense of it versus our resources uh, and the practical capabilities of a lot of theatres, um, at least a lot of the theatres we work with, make it prohibitively impractical. But we were fully con cognizant of the fact that that's not really a good excuse. That's just another vista for us. Um, and then beyond that, there are you know uh, autism friendly screenings, and and there's there's always something more. We're always working towards that. So in terms of who it's for, at some point, everybody, you know, in every context, that's what we're working towards. Yeah, I mean it's fascinating. I feel like I'm even I'm just like thrilled that there's even convers like that we're in an inclusive minded conversation time like I'm thrilled that that even exists because in the lifetime of making my film I just, you know like I right now I'm just like bless Gen Z who all want to you know like have captions on all the time and um, and you know even I did that little thumbs down about like you know, not having captions, but in fact, I have really mixed feelings about it. Like, I don't actually, I have very, very mixed feelings about like, and, and actually Chris, when Chris invited me to do this talk, you know, there have been a lot of panels about disability recently and like, um, and I, I, I really appreciated that, like in us talking about this, you were like, uh, catching something that I was like uh, about which is this sense that everyone should do creative captioning this term creative captioning makes me really squeamish because I actually actually really don't want um, a non-disabled subjectivity on the captions that I use I don't want someone to get creative and make assumptions about what might be interesting to me I really just want to believe that the captions are reliable and um, which is a tricky position because I don't want to be dogmatic and like you know ask people to minimize and at the same time it re it brings up these questions for me about like assumptions that someone might might be making about what I need. Um, so I what where yeah, how fifteen minutes left. If you want how to many? About fifteen minutes. Okay, um, I had like so many other questions, um, which, but we have 15 minutes left, and so I want to, um, I have this urge to just like do a free-for-all and be like, here are my questions, and <laughs> which like, I did want to just kind of bring up, um, ha which you actually just moved into it, which this, uh, this idea of access friction, um, of, uh, so even the fact that I am using, like I'm reading, the captions on an iPad in front of me that are really small and so it has my my eyes are so glued to this little iPad here on a chair meaning that I'm not like looking at any of you or like reading any of your faces or body expressions which is strange for me um, so the the access did something happen the zoom's still live but it's dropped off the screen did we lose? The Zoom call on the, on the oh. screen. Interesting. Um, can you all, are you all still seeing us? Oh wait, Liza, I think, I think you're muted or we, or maybe that's a technology thing we're having here. Go ahead, Liza, I think the captions might get you. So I muted a little bit, okay. Um, 
in the middle of explaining what I was going to do, which I kind of wanted to um, have a little bit of a free-for-all and invite um, the audience to ask questions. Um, and then in the midst of that, I was, I was just going to kind of throw out a few other topics that I was hoping that we would get to, um, which is this question of integrity and how we make work in various systems, um, either as ourselves or as advocates, um, the role of educating, um, that we're always sort of like in this position of educating others while asking for what we need. Um, and then I didn't really want to just be like Debbie Downer the whole time. I also wanted to ask, what are you really excited about in the world of accessibility um, and different dialogues and practices? So those are some of my other questions, but if I'm also just going to open it if anyone in the audience has anything they want to ask. Um, and as maybe some of you are formulating your questions, um, do you see any hands? Then also I'll invite um, Liza and Daniela and Jordan and Sean to respond to any of those little things that I just threw out. If you, if anything is like sparking some interest of something that you really want to like talk about. I mean, we also had a really amazing conversation and prep for this about um, about the in, the infrastructure around accessibility and around disability that actually can be extremely ill prepared. Um, so, anybody have any questions, or any of the panelists, if you want to? Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Questions or accusations <laughs> or compliments on my outfit. <laughs> Emerson, what? Did you have a question, Emerson? Yes, he said he had a question. Oh, you do? Okay, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to get an answer to this because I didn't see anything on the screen. <laughs> they are here, so we can probably relay what they've said, what oh, okay. they say back via the subtitles, maybe? All right, right. Well, to well, well, I just want to say that all of this, everything that's happening right now, the tech challenges, all of this is any study of accessibility as well, the random dropouts, all of the challenges that come with doing a panel like this. So thanks to ID for sticking with it regardless. And anyway, I just want to say, my name is Emerson Andrew, I'm a deaf film critic, and I just wanted to ask you a question about, um, it's hard to phrase it. I want to ask you a question about the invisibility or the visibility of deafness in your work. And I feel like as a deaf person, also who is a small d deaf person, someone who doesn't really feel like they fit into either the hearing or the deaf community, how do you deal with visibility in your work? Do you want to make it known overtly that you have a disabled subject position? Or is that something that you would rather withhold or only disclose to certain audiences? Does it change, depending on who the audience is, your visibility as a disabled person? That's my question. Thank you. I mean, first, I just want to say it's like my personal mission to make our own community of all the, of all of us who, you know, are in these in-between spaces. So, Emerson. <laughs> You're in. You're in. <laughs> okay, wait, but now we can't hear Liza. Well, with the, well, the subtitles here, Liza, we can maybe read oh my this. Gosh. Earlier during the Fire of Love um, talk, there was like a, a moment where this happened, and I was like, should I offer to lip read? Um, we can try. Okay, go ahead, Liza. So, Emerson, this is so kind of beautiful, the translation of, inf of information that's happening. I think, Liza, you just said that, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're getting weird here. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Liza loves that I am speaking for her. Thank you, Allison. You're welcome, Liza. <laughs> Um, Liza says, I almost forgot the question of figuring out how to do this. I will say that I think the kinship, oh, this is so weird. This is like, the, the, what's happening right now is a caption echo. It's cool. The aesthetics of accessibility right here. <laughs> It's really special because I've not had a community. This is Liza. I think the ice, oh. But as soon as I start talking, then the captions disappear. Hold on. Tricky. Um, you open transcript? What'd you say? Is the transcript option there? Yeah, good point. Yes. Keep going, Liza. I'm gonna go into the full transcript. Okay, awesome. So it's really special because I've not had a community. I think the isolating part of being lowercase deaf or hard of hearing, which is a term we're not really using anymore, even though I grew up. The captioner says, I can only caption one person at a time. <laughs> This is the soap opera of accessibility happening right now, and I am here for it. Okay. <laughs> sorry, caption. Sorry, Kara. You can do it, though. I mean, so I think the distinction between disability and ability, or, invi or invisible, invisibility, okay, also I'm reading caption things, so, um, Carrie, you're doing a great job, sorry. Okay, I mean, so I think the distinction between disability and ability, or invisible disability, invisible disability is enormous, it's larger than the earth, right? We can talk about all the, bring up, um, which you actually just, moved into it, which this, uh, this idea of access friction um, of, uh, so even the fact that I am using, like I'm reading the captions on an iPad in front of me that are really small. And so it has my, my eyes are so glued to this little iPad here on a chair, meaning that I'm not like looking at any of you or like reading any of your faces or body expressions, which is strange for me. Um, so the the access did something happen? Yeah. The Zoom's still live, but it's dropped off the screen. What did we lose? The Zoom call on the, on the oh. screen. Interesting. Um, can you all? Are you all still seeing us? Oh wait, Liza. I think I think you're muted, or we, or maybe that's a technology thing we're having here. Go ahead, Liza. I think the captions might get you. So I muted a little bit. Okay. Um, in the middle of explaining what I was going to do, which 
I kind of wanted to um, have a little bit of a free-for-all and invite um, the audience to ask questions. Um, and then in the midst of that, I was, I was just going to kind of throw out a few other topics that I was hoping that we would get to, um, which is this question of integrity and how we make work in various systems, um, either as ourselves or as advocates. Um, the role of educating, um, that we're always sort of like in this position of educating others while asking for what we need. Um, and then I didn't really want to just be like Debbie Downer the whole time. I also wanted to ask, what are you really excited about in the world of accessibility um, and different dialogues and practices? So those are some of my other questions, but if I'm also just going to open it if anyone in the audience has anything they want to ask. Um, and as maybe some of you are formulating your questions, um, do you see any hands? Then also I'll invite um, Liza and Daniela and Jordan and Sean to respond to any of those little things that I just threw out. If you, if anything is like sparking some interest of something that you really want to like talk about. I mean, we also had a really amazing conversation and prep for this about um, about. The, in, the infrastructure around accessibility and around disability that actually can be extremely ill-prepared. Um, so, anybody have any questions? Or any of the panelists, if you wanna? Don't be shy. <laughs> questions or accusations <laughs> or compliments on my outfit. <laughs> Emerson, what? Did you have a question, Emerson? Yes, he said he had a question. Oh, you do? Okay, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to get an answer to this because I didn't see anything on the screen. <laughs> they are here, so we can probably relay what they've said, what okay. they say back via the subtitles, maybe? All right, right. Well, to well, well, I just want to say that all of this, everything that's happening right now, the tech challenges, all of this is any study of accessibility as well, the random dropouts, all of the challenges that come with doing a panel like this. So thanks to ID for sticking with it regarding this. And anyway, I just want to say, my name is Emerson Ru, I'm a deaf film critic, and I just wanted to ask you a question about, um, it's hard to phrase it. I want to ask you a question about the invisibility or the visibility of deafness in your work. And I feel like as a deaf person, also who is a small d deaf person, someone who doesn't really feel like they fit into either the hearing or the deaf community, how do you deal with visibility in your work? Do you want to make it known overtly that you have a disabled subject position? Or is that something that you would rather withhold or only disclose to certain audiences? Does it change, depending on who the audience is, your visibility as a disabled person? That's my question. Thank you. I mean, first, I just want to say it's like my personal mission to make our own community of all the, of all of us who, you know, are in these in-between spaces. So, Emerson. <laughs> You're in. You're in. <laughs> okay, wait, but now we can't hear Liza. Well, with the, well, the subtitles here, Liza, we can maybe read oh my this. Gosh. Earlier during the Fire of Love um, talk, there was like a, a moment where this happened, and I was like, should I offer to lip read? Um, we can try. Okay, go ahead, Liza. So, Emerson, this is so kind of beautiful, the translation of inf information that's happening. I think, Liza, you just said that, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're getting weird here. <laughs> Liza loves that I am speaking for her. Thank you, Allison. 
You're welcome, Liza. <laughs> Um, Liza says, I almost forgot the question of figuring out how to do this. I will say that I think the kinship, oh, this is so weird. This is like, the, the, what's happening right now is a caption echo. It's cool. The aesthetics of accessibility right here. <laughs> It's really special because I've not had a community. This is Liza. I think the ice, oh. But as soon as I start talking, then the captions disappear. Hold on. Tricky. Um, Can you open transcript? What'd you say? Is the transcript option there? Yeah, good okay. point. Yes. Keep going, Liza. I'm gonna go into the full transcript. Okay, awesome. So it's really special because I've not had a community. I think the isolating part of being lowercase deaf or hard of hearing, which is a term we're not really using anymore, even though I grew up. The captioner says, I can only caption one person at a time. <laughs> This is the soap opera of accessibility happening right now, and I am here for it. Okay. <laughs> sorry, caption. Sorry, Kara. You can do it, though. I mean, so I think the distinction between disability and ability, or invi or invisible invisibility. Okay. Also, I'm reading caption things. So, um, Carrie, you're doing a great job. Sorry. Okay. I mean, so I think the distinction between disability and ability, or invisible disability, invisible disability is enormous. It's larger than the earth, right? We can talk about all these distinctions for other. And as a younger person, I really wanted to have an identity and I never had one before. I've always, you know, existed in the space between other identities. And so um, I think it's been amazing to, um, at this stage in this era, disability and art, where the borders are sort of disintegrating a little bit. I feel like I'm, yeah. okay, all right. I think we're good. Hey. Yes. But you're muted now, Liza. <laughs> Do we have any audience questions? Someone made a joke earlier, my friend made it over there, that I was gonna have to do the river dance if like all the technology like you know failed. And I think I just did a like version of <laughs> Okay. So I'm gonna go back to um how, how are your real time? Have a we have four minutes left. There's a question in the chat from Jim Lobrecht. Uh, okay. Um, can somebody read the question? Because I can't see it. I don't know, the panelists maybe can read it on Zoom. 
Um, I can read it. This is Jordan speaking. So Jim asked, can you let people that don't know about us that FWD or Forward Doc exists? We are a community of almost 600 filmmakers with disabilities and our allies. And then it's the link to the um, website, which is HTTPS colon slash slash FWD hyphen doc dot org slash join hyphen FWD doc. Yeah, thanks for also bringing that up, Jen. Um, it's awesome to know about y'all. Okay, well, um, any last questions in the audience? Okay. Um, I think if we had four minutes left, however many minutes ago that was, this is probably three minutes left. Okay. Then, um, I guess maybe Jordan or Daniela, I'll invite you if you have any like kind of closing comments or um, or thoughts or something that you really hoped to have communicated. Um, give you some space. I did ask this question about what are you most excited about right now happening in terms of accessibility. So maybe we can close out on that note. Jordan? Yeah. Uh, sure, this is Jordan talking. Um, this is probably obvious to say, but I'm just most excited about Bill's work <laughs> and the work of other disabled artists who are like actually just doing um, really brilliant things around access. I'm definitely wary, we're not gonna talk about the bad stuff, but I'm wary of like the interest shown by institutions toward access I want to be optimistic toward it, but I, um, I don't know, I just think that, um, like, I hadn't seen your films, Daniela, for instance, and I thought they were amazing, and I'm really excited to learn about your films by doing this event, so thank you, Chris, for organizing this, and um, Allison for moderating it, and Liza and Daniela, for, and um, Sean for being part of this conversation, it's, the stuff I'm most excited about in the world. You? What are you the most excited about, Sean? Oh boy. Um, I'm excited about Sidecard, which is the thing that we, we're doing, which collates all the excess materials and hopes to promote their use in screenings and elsewhere. So I'm excited about that seeing that come to life. I think I think I'm um, I'm really uh, I um, echo what Jordan is saying, um, but I'm also really really excited about um, the the coming disabled artists and what they're um, you know how they're gonna also like contribute to this field and and I'm like I'm just really excited of this mix of like Gen Z meets like older like late uh deafened people or people you know i think we have this like huge population of people who always are like minimizing themselves who have been have existed um in life minimizing their disabilities and now as like those of us who are like you know getting hearing aid haircuts and stuff i like i'm i just i'm really excited about the um like the pride and um, excited about what generationally will come out of that. That just feels to me like, like even to have um, an audio description um, of, of like a self description where you're really excited about talking about your fashion and what you're wearing is just like <laughs> the delightfulness and the fun in you know accessibility I think is so powerful and beautiful. And so I'm excited about this community broadening. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to IDA. Thank you, Chris, for inviting and um, imagining this panel. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Liza. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you to our access workers, Laura, Kenton, and um, there was someone else who disappeared who I, I didn't see your name. But thank you all. And talk with you soon, see you soon.